hello, everybody, and thank you for taking the time to check out my little program here. I have a big guest today, Brian Wheat. He is the bass player for Tesla. And this band has sold over 14 million records in the U.S. They have 24, I counted, rock radio singles, two top 10 pop radio singles. But more importantly, their music stands the test of time, in my opinion. It still sounds great today. And Brian has written a book about his experience with Tesla. It's called Son of a Milkman, My Crazy Life with Tesla. And he calls it Son of a Milkman because he literally was the illegitimate son of a milkman. So it's like that old joke you would say to, you know, like to your friends when you're, you're in middle school, like, oh, your dad's not even your real dad. It's probably the milkman. Well, that really was the case with Brian. And that's not even the craziest thing in this book about his life. It's got all the typical sex, drugs, and rock and roll stuff, but also there's fights, there's bulimia, there's hookers, and so much more. Uh, unfortunately, I had a time limit with Brian, and we only had about 30 minutes, so we just scratched the surface of a lot of this stuff. So do yourself a favor, get the book. It's an easy read. I finished it in two days, and he doesn't beat around the bush in the book. These are not uh, drawn out, super detailed descriptions of what happened. He just tells you bluntly what happens or what he thinks, and then he moves on to the next thing. So it's a great book, and uh, Brian clears up some of my questions in this interview, so enjoy it. Uh, welcome, Brian Wheat, to the Chuck Shoot Podcast. How are you doing? Hey, man. How are you? Great. Great. Um, so, yeah, I read the whole book. I listened to some interviews. I've learned a lot about you. I thought this was interesting that, um, you know, besides music, obviously, uh, you were actually a talented baseball player. And when you were young, you when you started playing the bass, you decided, I'm going to play bass and I'm going to be a musician and you gave up baseball. Why not con continue with both? Why did you feel like you had to give up on the sports? Because I think either one of those professions, whether you want to be a musician or a baseball player, you have to give it your all. And, uh, you know, you couldn't commit to being a baseball player and a musician. It, you, there's not enough time. So, you know, you had to pick one or the other. Okay, fair enough. So, I mean, so you kind of did decide at that point that you were in it to, to do it for a living, right? Not just as a hobby. No, no, no. I <laughs> wanted to. Yeah, no, I wasn't in it as a hobby. I wanted to. I wanted to make it in the music business. For sure. And so Frank Hannon, your uh, Tesla bandmate, he actually lived down the street from you. And you guys played in a few bands together. Do you ever wonder what your life would be like? if you didn't live down the street from him, like to you guys were totally different cities. Yeah. There probably wouldn't be a Tesla. Really? You think so? Well, yeah, I know. So, I mean, you know, it, it all, there's a series of events that happened that, you know, led to that band forming and being that band, mm -hmm. you know, if, had I never met Frank Hannon, there wouldn't be a Tesla. Right. And then when you met Jeff Keith, your singer, you actually, the first time you heard him sing, you thought he sucked, which was kind of shocking to me. I was like, was he not good at that point? Or do you think you just weren't? I couldn't, I couldn't hear him. You know, I, I couldn't hear him because he, he didn't know how to hold his microphone. Mm. So all, all you heard That's was right. this, feed, this feedback. But That's Frank what it was. was yeah. close enough to, to hear him sing you know, in, in his ear. So Frank could hear that he had a good voice for sure. Yeah. So that, that, that's kind of, so once you heard him sing with a good sound once system, I could hear him, yeah. yeah, you could hear he had this great voice. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And this was, yeah, I never thought he sucked. It's just the night he played, you couldn't hear him. Couldn't hear shit. Yeah, for sure. You couldn't hear shit. And you went, well, you know, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't, you know, Frank was, you know, thank God Frank heard his voice. Right. Yeah, no, because he's obviously a great singer. And so around this time when you guys were first starting Tesla, you were working at McDonald's. And uh, this is when you would, uh, it's like that movie Super Size Me. You, you gained 80 pounds uh, working there. And then you did this diet. I've never heard of this diet, the rotation diet. So you do 800 calories one day, 1100 the next, then 1400 the next cal uh, day. And then you repeat that whole cycle. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was a week. It was, it was weekly. It changed. Yeah. So, yeah, um, yeah. It was. It, it works pretty good, man. I never heard. How did you even find that diet? I've never heard of that. 
They used to have it at the grocery store. Oh, okay. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, and you yeah. had a you had an interesting quote. If I'm just gonna read, I don't want to you know we don't re- give away the whole book here, but I do want to read this quote about that uh, you losing the weight from the book. It says, "Losing the weight taught me that everything has the power to control what they need to do, or uh, everyone has the power to control what they need to do." Personally, it was just sheer discipline. There was nothing fun or enjoyable or easy about it when I first started. But then the goal is in sight. It gets a lot easier, and you feel good about yourself. Attaining that goal shows you that it's possible. Then you can start to think that way about other things in your life, relationships, career, whatever. It's willpower and perseverance. That's the formula. It got me where I needed to be. We all get lazy at times and we don't care, that, but that's not an excuse. That's the key. Don't make excuses because they're easy to find. So do you feel like with, uh, with that approach, is that what you kind of took to other things in life, like with Tesla? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean... You know, that's my kind of mantra for life. And it was kind of that that work ethic that helped. I think, did you say it was one of your first managers that kind of like really drilled in that the work ethic for you guys too, even though you ended up parting ways with him? He really. Yeah. Yeah. Steve Klausman, our first manager. When we were kids, we used to think he was a drill sergeant. We used to fucking, you know, hate him, but, you know, we loved him. And, uh, he's the one that taught us our work ethic absolutely yeah we owe it to him so that helped and then when you guys um are looking for the record for producers I, I was curious about this why do you think so many producers turned you guys down for that first record i mean i know you guys were unknown but it was a major label uh do you think a lot of other, do the producers even listen to the demos or anything or do they just say well, i've never heard of this band remember at that at that time it was such an image conscious thing right right so maybe maybe they weren't listening with their ears they were looking with their eyes okay and uh you know maybe that's what it was i don't know i mean i'm glad they turned us down because it was all meant to be the way it was meant to be and you know, Michael and Steve were meant to produce those those that first record. It, it all happened the way it was supposed to in the cosmic scheme of it all. You know what I mean? Even though you're not happy with some of the audio production on that first record, you you talked about that well, multiple let's, times. Let, let's just let's just get that straight. Okay. I think the record could be. I didn't like the way the record was mixed. Mixed, right? The reverb. I love the record. I think the record is great. I think there's great songs on it, great performances. I just don't like that it's swimming in a bunch of reverb. Right. And and you know that's uh, that's all right. I'm sure everyone has something to say about their first album that they would do over again, and that that's what it is. Mm-hmm. For sure. No, For but me. the songs are, are legendary. And then that first album, it ended up, it ended up going multi platinum. And MTV played that uh, video, Modern Day Cowboy, and then all the radio stations played it. And MTV, it seemed like they had such power back then. Do you think that they really loved your song, or did your managers have to, and the record label, have to kind of grease the wheels a little bit to get no, them to play no, it? No, no, no. It was purely organic. They liked the song, and then the fans started to call in, and it, it, you know, it happened organically, just like Signs did. Oh, okay. You know, no, our, man, our managers, you know, even though they managed Def Leppard and stuff, you know, they had some pull, but MTV, you know, if that was the case, all our records would have been on MTV. Yeah. You know, for sure. So you guys tour with David Lee Roth. And I, th- I thought this was interesting that he and his manager had offered to to manage you guys, but you turned him down. Was that out of sheer loyalty to the managers that you had at the time? Or did you really feel like your current management team was better than what David Lee Roth had? Well, I didn't know what David Lee Roth had. You know, and obviously, looking back at it now, David Lee Roth never really managed any bands, did he? No. Um, you know, it was we had we were perfectly happy with our managers. We had Peter and Cliff. They managed Def Leppard. You know, they were they were you know they were highly regarded managers. So we just you know kind of chuckled, and you know that was that. Yeah. And so, and you toured with, uh, tell me about the differences. Cause you said David Lee Roth, it was a lot of like the rock star kind of stuff. But then when you toured with Alice Cooper, there was none of that. You And you felt like maybe David Lee Roth was trying to kind of put on a show for you guys sometimes. Like you walked in the dressing room and there's like panties on the ground and stuff. And you're like, is this for real? Or is he? No, that's when we, we met him that night. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. We, he called us to his room when the last night of the tour, when he asked us to uh, manage us and he had these two chicks with them and there were a couple pair of panties on the floor and, <laughs> you know, Dave was putting on the Dave show and, you know, looking back on it, it's fucking hilarious. Man. <laughs> it's like the show. Sorry, sorry, yeah. Dave. That's funny, though. So this was interesting, too. You said at the height of your career, you guys would be playing arenas and you would walk around the venue during the opening band and no one recognized you. Is that is that really true? Like nobody ever recognized you? Because there has to be some diehard fans out there. Well, there would be a few. But okay. as, as a rule, no. I mean, you know. You know, I had a cap on or whatever, but, you know, people, people really, you know, th they don't really, they, they usually associate like, you know, if, if Tesla wasn't in town playing and I went to Chicago, you'd find a few diehards that might see on Michigan Avenue sh shopping. But for the most part, people would, you know, they would never, we weren't recognizable guys. We weren't, hmm. we weren't you know on the cover of magazines we weren't all over the tv <laughs> louise it's okay he's just asking <laughs> i know you tell him louise you tell him mm. you tell him girl uh so uh, my jack russell you know she's telling you what's up okay yeah uh, i read about yeah. your dogs too yeah yeah um so yeah they you know they they you know, I, I think Jeff probably was the most recognized guy in the band. Sure. That's always the way it is with singers. Did you know? So did you do that just because you wanted to watch the opening band or were you kind of doing that as a test to see if people would uh, recognize? I wanted to see the opening band. I wanted to see, you know, what, what was out there in the audience, you know, what the reaction was like hmm. scope for chicks, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that's funny so yeah and then the second record uh great radio controversy um i thought this was interesting too that the that you guys had to fight to get love song on the record which has ended up being one of if not your number one greatest hit ever the management didn't want it and jeff literally cried because they didn't want it why do you think they didn't want that song i mean you listen to it and it's I don't know. brilliant they didn't, they didn't get it you know mm. them or the the A and R guy, but you know, we fought, we won. The song happened, and you know, once we put out the song, they got it. I mean, mm. they certainly, you know, it wouldn't have become a hit without the the backing of the record company and our management. But in the beginning, they didn't think it was the song, so they didn't want to put it on the album. It's just so interesting because usually it's the opposite. Usually, the record label wants the you know the ballad or the slow song, and the band is saying no, we want you know harder stuff. And you guys were the ones saying, no, we believe in the song. And they were, then they didn't. It was just like interesting to me. Yeah. Well, there you go. Yeah. So you toured with poison and you said you really yeah. liked CC DeVille and um, he was cool, but you thought the other guys like were a little too cocky or rock star. You said at the time, again, I know you're friends with them now, but at the time you thought Brett Michaels was a punk. What did he do that made you think that he was a punk? Uh, he tackled me in a flag football game. <laughs> what? We were having a football game and the fucker tackled me. I was going for a touchdown in, in a flag football game. Really? And, and then he took himself out of the game because I said, okay, now we're going to play tackle. He was scared of you retaliating. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I, I love Brett. I, all those guys were all you know, great buddies. That was, you know, back when we were young and we were, you know, all on our head trips, you know, and, and, uh, you know, they were, they were, you know, CC was pretty cool. Uh, you know, the other three kind of were caught up in, in, in the thing. And that happens, you know, that happens. That's easy to happen. That's easy to get caught up in, in the hype. For but, sure. You know, today, today I toured with them a couple of years ago and they're great. I, I, I love those guys. They're great. That's cool that you guys can kind of move past that kind of BS. Stuff. Well, we all, we all grew up. Yeah. You know what I mean, I mean, there was no, you know, rivalry or nothing. I, you know, if I would have got my hands on bread, I would have tackled the, 
broke his arm or something. <laughs> Who knows, you know? Yeah. Uh, you know, and I, <laughs> and I told him when I saw him a couple years ago, I still owe you a tackle. And he just <laughs> kind of laughed. But uh, they're, uh, you know, we're all good buddies. That's cool. And, and, you know, they've all they've all grown up and we've grown up and that yeah. happens, you know, it happens when For you're sure. young. For sure. So then Psychotic Supper. I love this. See, that's one of my favorites. I think you said it was one of your best ones, too. But I thought this was a funny. Can you tell this story about how the A&R guy, uh, Tom Zutat, he came in and he wanted the producer to increase the echo on <laughs> what you give? And, uh, yeah. and, and the producer didn't want to do it. So he used this engineering trick where he pretended to turn a knob that didn't do anything. And he's like, yeah, I, I got it. But Tom didn't fall for it. Right? No, hell no. No, Tom didn't fall for it. And then the, the, uh, the, uh, the assistant engineer threw Michael under the bus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He called him out. Yeah. So he, you know, he, he did it. And we still didn't hear any, you know, more echo on the acoustic guitar. And uh, and Tom looked at the assistant engineer and he looked at him. He said, did, did he did he do that? And the assistant engineer said, no. <laughs> <laughs> and then Tom just oh, blew up. That's you know? funny. There's so many good went, stories like that. Went, Tell me more about this one, too. Um, you guys toured with Scorpions and then you did a private show for the King of Sweden. I didn't even know. Yeah. I feel like really dumb because I didn't know Sweden had kings. Like, does he live in a yeah. castle? Does he wear a crown? Like, walk me through this. Yeah, it was a, we went to their palace and we played acoustic after the show. And, and uh, you know, we, I guess, his, I don't know if his kid was a big Tesla fan or something. Oh. But, you know, basically we went and played this party oh. acoustic, you know. And, uh, you know, obviously we ate like kings and drank like kings. and. It was great in Stockholm, yeah. That sounds fun. So yeah. then um, I think it was around the time for the, the Bust and Nut record, which is another one that I really love. Um, and Tommy had left the band, then he rejoined. And somehow there was a, there was a show, and, and I think it was Tommy's drama or something. It led to a fight with Jeff and the drummer Troy getting into a yeah. fist fight backstage. But to explain to me this, like walk me through this one too, because I'm, I'm picturing this image. And you said usually you and Frank would try to break it up or one of you would try to break. And you said that this time you just said, fuck it. We're just going to watch. And you sat back on the couch and you're eating ice cream cones and you're just watching this fight. Like, were you rooting for one of them to win or? No, not really. We were just, you know, we just sat there, me and Frank, you know, it was like watching Friday night at the fight, you know? <laughs> And uh, we just said, fuck it, we're not breaking it up, you know, because this happened quite a bit, you know. Um, you know, with Troy and Jeff, they'd get into arguments and then it'd turn into a brawl. And, uh, and, and you know, we just we just sat there and ate our ice cream cones <laughs> and kind of laughed about it. I mean, that's a funny yeah, image when you think you when know, you. Yeah. You had to laugh. You yeah. Know? I mean, and the two, those two were fighting and they didn't even have a problem. You know, it was Tommy had, you know, fell off the wagon again and, you know, was asked to leave again. I mean, I think he was asked to leave four or five, six times total. So he, he certainly had a lot of chances to get his, his act together. Yeah. So but, you say but, that you guys still get into a lot of fights today, but you, you call these ones discussions. Like, do you think that friction and the yeah, it doesn't get physical. Yeah, yeah. So, but do you think that that like friction and the passion that kind of helps make Tesla great? Like, if in other words, if everyone was too well, mellow, we're passionate. You yeah, know, we're all very passionate with our opinions, you know, and and what we believe in, and I think it does lend to what Tesla is. You know, look, if we hadn't been passionate about love song, we would. You know, we that wouldn't have wound up on the record. So right. we have pa we're passionate amongst ourselves as well. And I don't call them fights anymore because they don't turn into. We've grown out of the physical altercation, you know, and and we just have these discussions. I like to call them. Okay, is there screaming during discussions or sometimes? Okay, right. sometimes there's motherfuckers in there and you know, <laughs> stuff like that. <laughs> But, yeah, you know we're 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 a family. Yeah, you know I mean 
that's the one thing I realized, especially, you know, sitting here through this COVID thing, is that, you know, the, the four of us have been through a lot of shit together, mm -hmm. all four of us. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there's, there's a brother in there. It's kind of, you know, even though we may argue with each other sometimes or call each other motherfuckers, and, you know, I mean, that's what brothers do, you know? I mean, you got any brothers? Yeah, I got two brothers. So, yeah, no, we definitely, I mean, I feel like we're, well, I don't. You ever fight with them? Yeah, I mean, we that was more when we were younger and living together. But see, that's the thing is like now okay, that we have our own houses. Yeah, see, we're if you, if I together. was on a band, if I was on a tour bus with them, I'm sure we'd probably kill each other. You gotta realize yeah. we're like married to each other yeah. as well. It's like it's like right. brothers in a marriage. So, you know, sometimes you argue and cuss at each other, and, right? You know, but we wouldn't let anyone else fuck with one of us. So how do you know where the, cause obviously with Tommy and I know you've talked about this a lot in other interviews, but you know, things went South that, but how, how did he cross the line to where you can't make up with him? What, what because he just, Me? I just, man, the, you know, the, he, I'd really rather not rap about that, man. Mm -hmm. But is it I weird? Mean, you know, look, look, yeah. We're not going to be friends. You yeah. know I mean? He's not going to call me and say, hey, hey, how you doing? And I'm not going to call him and say, hey, hey, how you doing? You know, the one thing we had in common was Tesla. And he's not he's not been in Tesla for 16 years now. So, I mean, you know, if I saw him on the street, you know, I'd probably say hello and ask him how he was. And, you know, who knows how he would react? He might tell me to go fuck myself. And then, you know. Who knows what would happen? I, I I'd probably just go fuck myself. <laughs> but know, is it, maybe is, I'd yeah. or maybe I'd slap him. I don't know. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? I mean, you know, we're just, you know, it, he he just, you know, he he was in the band and he he got several chances to stay in the band and he chose not to. And then, you know, he went around saying some not nice things about. So, you know, why he singled me out, you know, I don't know, but he chose to, you know, he didn't say bad things about other people in the band. He just wanted to use me as his target, probably because I was the one that was most vocal and honest about his shenanigans, you know? Mm -hmm. So being that as it may, you know, I don't, I don't, have a desire to call him up and say, no, hey, let's no. be friends. No, but if he you called know. you and apologize, like maybe he goes through a 12 step if he thing called or something. Me and, and said, hey, man, you know, I'd like to clear the air and, and just, I would, I would accept it. Fair enough. Okay. Okay. You know, yeah. I, and I'm not saying he has to call me. I'm not going to call him because, you know, what I know of him, he'd probably tell me to fuck off. So I'm not going to call him. Right. I agreed. Okay. You know? But enough. it's not like I have this deep desire to become friends with him. Like right. there's something missing in my life. But is you it know, weird? Not. Is it weird knowing? I look, mm. I, I don't wish him any ill will. Mm -hmm. I don't have a voodoo doll of Tommy at home <laughs> and I'm poking with the mm -hmm. pen. You know, I, yeah. I wish him all the best. I mean, I heard one of his songs the other day from his new band i thought it was really good I, I was like great fantastic that's that's the tommy skio i know that's the kind of work i'm used to him doing you know what i mean mm -hmm. oh absolutely and so then you know after after saying that he calls tesla you know says that you know all the music we do now is lounge music <laughs> so what? you know every, okay. every time i start to feel something for him he opens his mouth and says something negative about you know, the band or us. And then I just figure, well, then again, he hasn't, hasn't, you know, grown up. I, yeah. I don't know. Okay. I mean, honestly, I don't, I don't, the only time I ever really talk or think about him is when people like you bring it up. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah. It is part of my job, but so let's move on. No, let's... no, I, I, I get that, but I'm just saying, yeah. you understand what I'm saying? Oh yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. No, totally. Yeah. Know, I just didn't know if I you don't sit around yeah. and, 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 and contemplate what it would it be right. like if Tommy was here. No, that's fair enough. But so another yeah. th way that you guys uh, dealt with your problems was uh, you, you actually went to see a psychiatrist. You had seen a psychiatrist privately, but then you brought the band in 
to see a psychiatrist yeah. together um, because there were things that you couldn't you needed to say to each other that you couldn't say without a mediator. What, so what kinds of things did you have a hard time saying to each other as opposed, you know, that you had to say in therapy as opposed to just saying it over a beer or a cup of coffee? Well, because usually what happens is when we tried to have a discussion, it erupted in a big fight. Mm. And what we were trying to avoid was a big blowout where if you had some mediator, it didn't escalate into this big fucking blowout. And then you didn't get anything done for two days because you were sitting around sulking because you hurt each other's feelings. Right. So that was why the psychiatrist was brought in. And that worked then it helped. Get, it worked. You know. Yeah. He taught us, you know, that how to, 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 to communicate with mm-hmm, each other. Mm-hmm. So another thing I thought was interesting in the book, when you talk about when the, the band had a short hiatus for a while and you were working on music stuff, you were producing demos and things, but some of the other band members, I thought, I thought it was interesting. Frank was doing landscaping. Uh, Troy was doing yeah. roofing and Jeff worked as a, a DJ at a strip club. Like, I mean, is that weird for them to take these, you know, almost like demeaning jobs. I would feel like if you're, you know, you would well, go from being I, a big I rock star. You'd, you'd, you'd have to ask them. I can't speak for them. You know what I mean? Um, mm-hmm. You know, look, I mean, Tesla are survivors in all of us. The band is living Testament that we survived a lot of, you know, obstructions in our, in our career and managed to, uh, you know, overcome them. So at that point in time, it was just another, roadblock and people did what they had to do i mean yeah uh, if anything if anything i admire them for it because they didn't you know go on welfare and you know they all went to work that's you true know I mean? yeah. Yeah. doing whatever they could do i thought you know their, you just you'd think that at least they would be doing guitar lessons or singing lessons or something music family. yeah well you know i don't know man you know, uh, Troy's a damn good roofer, and you know Jeff was a—he he had a lot of fun being a DJ <laughs> at a strip club. And, yeah, probably not the worst job yeah, in the world. Fuck, so. I mean, you know, there's worse jobs you yeah, could do, I for suppose. Sure. Yeah. So, and you know, Frank was landscaping. He mm-hmm. likes gardening. Yeah. All right. Fair enough. And so, you know, it's interesting. During it was like because in the '80s and stuff, you really didn't get into the drugs. And then it wasn't until kind of the band's hiatus or kind of the, the later years that you started to get more into the drugs. And then I, but I think you've struggled with the depression and the anxiety and all that stuff for a long time. So I wanted to ask you about this. You said that normally you weren't suicidal, but there was a time, uh, I think it was in Canada. No, recently? no, I was never suicidal. Never. But you kind all, of. All I said was there, I used to wonder why people, I, I couldn't wrap my head around how it would get so bad that, you know, Tony Bourdain would hang himself or Chris Cornell. And when I had this one bout of depression, it got so bad that I finally understood how they could do that. Not that I was contemplating it, but I got it. I, I got the magnitude of, well, if this was what they're going through, I could see how someone could could take their lives i I didn't um, i didn't contemplate it you know okay at all but so when you're in that place of severe anxiety or depression or dealing with these hard hard things and having those issues um like what do you think would help you like how can we prevent the next chris cornell or chester bennington as someone who's kind of been through that prevented is who's ever had suffering at the time needs to reach out to somebody and and talk about it talk with somebody i think when you isolate yourself and you don't reach out or talk to anybody that can be a very dark dangerous place because you're just on your own and then you just battle your mind and you know if you got a friend or you know somebody you can reach out to or if not call the suicide hotline you know what i mean Mm -hmm. yeah you put that number in your book that's the mistake I think people make um, is that it's very easily to, to when you're depressed to want to isolate and that can be very dangerous. Mm-hmm, mm. So you think that's kind of an instinctual thing? Cause I, I also wondered if part of it was the stigma, like it, you know, you're, you're weak. Well, if there you're... is this stigma as well. Mm. You know, you don't want to appear to be, you isolate cause you don't want people to think you're weak. 
you know, because right. that's what people think if you suffer from depression, you know, you're a weakling or you're mentally weak. And that's not a case at all. It's just, you know, no one knows what causes it. it, it it's an imbalance or whatever it is in your brain that throws you into this. And, you know, it, it's just, you know, no one knows. So right. there's always been a stigma on it that, you know, you're broken. And so then people tend to isolate because they don't want to be judged or, you know, whatever the case. Mm -hmm. so, helping, so I think with yeah. people like, you know, Chris and, and Anthony Bourdain and stuff, it makes people aware that, hey, you know, this can happen to anybody, even people that are at the height of their career. Um, you know, they're not broken. They just, you know, uh, I don't know. Yeah. You know, I, I'm not a psychiatrist, you know, but I'm just a guy that has suffered from anxiety and depression and just trying to help anyone I can by just maybe putting the word out there like, hey, I'm too one of those guys. Mm -hmm. And know? reducing the stigma and making it seem more normal because it really is. So, I mean, there's so many millions of people that suffer with that stuff. So. Yeah, yeah. You know, the world's a, a fucking wacky place, man. It sure is. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, it is over the 30 minute mark here. So I do, I'll, I'll let you uh, wrap up here, but I do like to end with a charity. Is there a, a charity or organization that you work with that you want to give a shout out to? Oh man. You know, my, my, my heart goes out to everyone right now suffering from, you know, losing their business and, and, and being shut down by this COVID thing and not being able to, to, to earn a living i'd like to see some help for those people you know uh right now you know i think those people could use a hand especially you know like the people that are in the road crews for the bands you know they're not they're not working and that's how they make their living yeah. so my heart goes out to those guys okay and girl well, we could, uh, I think there's save our stages as a big one that, um, I can put that in the notes if that's, yeah, whatever. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You find, you find the one. I'll man. find you something. Know, that's right. your job. You okay. know how to do that. Yeah. I do. Yeah. That's one thing I'm good at. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to, to do this interview. I really appreciate it, Brian. Where are you at, man? I'm in Scottsdale. Ah, it's nice and warm there. Yeah. It's very beautiful. I see all my neighbors are shoveling or not neighbors, but, uh, friends on Facebook and stuff are shoveling snow and I'm like driving with the windows down and it's like 65, 70 degrees. So uh, fucking bastard. <laughs> Wait, are you in New Jersey now or Texas? Like you have two places, right? Uh, or, well, I have a place in upstate New York. New York. I have a place in Texas. I'm at the Texas house right oh, now because, yeah. because I came here because it's supposed to be warm for the winter. Yeah. But I, I heard there's and a we, snowstorm. We've just and... gone three days without power and water in a big giant snowstorm. here. So. Is your power back now though? Or no? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's but, good. You know, they're not very well equipped for this kind of snow in Texas. No, no, they're not. It's very unusual, so. Yeah. All right, we'll try to stay warm. Yeah, man. You uh, take care, buddy. Okay, I appreciate it. Thanks, Brian. Cheers. Bye-bye. So many great stories, many hilarious, crazy, sad, uncomfortable, but it's all in the book. And again, it's called Son of a Milkman, My Crazy Life with Tesla by Brian Wheat. So get it, read it, and enjoy it. And make sure to follow Brian and Tesla on social media to keep up with them and what they're doing. And while you're at it, if uh, while you're on there, if you want to give me a follow or share this episode, I'd really appreciate that. Thank you so much for listening. Have a great day. And remember to shoot for the moon.